Hello and good morning. I am so happy that you're here to join me, Mr. Fowler, for week seven of College English 103, section three, 5005. Today we've got a lot on our docket, including some time spent explaining the second project for this semester. So without further ado, Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to use my share screen option here. And let's see this. Let's start by taking a look at the announcements for this week. <clears throat> First of all, I wanted to say something about the final grades for the self-assessment project. As we get ready to move into March, it's time for our second project to begin, which consequently means we're going to lay the self-assessment to rest. The grades are posted and should be visible through the grade link here on Desire to Learn. Let's move Mr. Fowler out of the way. And I'm going to drop down the more option than you can see right here next to me. The grades tab should be where you need to access, uh, where you need to go to access your grade and the results for that particular first assignment. Not too big of a deal, but just in case you forgot how to access it, that's where it is. I can't really click on it right now because then I would show everyone's grade uh, calculated to the current percentage and that violates FERPA laws. So can't do it, but at least I can show you where to go to find that link. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, if you, I think I received um, 17 out of 19 drafts, uh, final drafts. So I think I had, I have spoken to one student who had some um, extraordinary circumstances. So I'm still waiting for that final draft to come my way. And uh, if you are, listening to this, watching this, and you're thinking, can I turn that in? Um, I better check with Mr. Fowler. Please do check with me. Uh, that way we can make sure that everything is uh, set up as it needs to be. Okay. So what are we going to do for the rest of today's session? Well, let's take a look at that. Specifically, we're going to uh, introduce the second project. We'll preview that right here. Okay. And then we've got some PowerPoints to catch up on. Your reading for this week will uh, have covered chapter 12 and 13. So we're going to be going over chapter 12 and 13 for today's lecture points. Then we're gonna spend a little bit of time with grammar based on some of the issues I saw uh, percolating in the self-assessment draft. We should pause long enough to talk about fragments, comma splices, and run-ons, identifying what those issues are and how to correct those mistakes in our writing as well as the writing of others. You also have a weekly discussion thread question. I hope that you enjoyed having last week sort of to yourselves, but this week we have a uh, thread and discussion question for you to think about Specifically, I'm going to ask you to compare the idea of endorsements to athletes both in the eSport and um, video game uh, arena, but also in terms of how <clears throat> we would compare endorsements and the ongoing debate about whether or not we would pay college level athletes to um, participate in sports. So that idea, those discussion questions are available through the link that you see there uh, on week seven. And I think it'll be a rousing and interesting debate. Okay. We're, we're seeing more and more of the kinds of topics that we're prepping to, for discussion as we move into the third essay, the argumentative essay. And we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Now for next week, you have uh, some reading to do. 
three chapters this time, 14, 15, and 16. And another article, how, how the sound that defined 80s music still lives on today, which is available through the link in Desire to Learn. So that's what's on our agenda for right now. Okay. Like I said, I was so pleased with the fact that all of you did very well on your self-assessment essay that I feel we are ready to move forward for the next uh, project and sort of start thinking about what potential topics we want to cover for this next essay, the analysis project. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm gonna stop the video feed this time. And I'm going to share my screen again though. So you should be able to see this. Ah, here it is, the analysis. Okay. All right, let's start with the basics, shall we? What are we looking at? Let me make it a little bit larger for you. So the analysis project is a little bit heftier than say the peer, or sorry, um, <clears throat> the self-assessment. That was about 7% of your grade. The peer review was about 8%, so it was a little bit more uh, weighted. But then this one, the analysis essay, we're jumping all the way up to about 26%. Um, that, uh, that's pretty hefty. It's as valued as the argument with it. And then of course your participation and uh, in terms of your attendance, and the work ethic that you're putting forward is 13% and another 13% is based, of course, on the discussions. Okay. Let's take a look at the day of the draft being due. I know this might seem like it's coming up a little bit quickly, more quickly, but this is your second paper. You should be ready for a slightly more challenging essay assignment, which means the time frame will feel a little bit more constricted. So the draft is due just before we go on uh, spring break. Spring break, I believe, is the 21st to the 25th. So I figured that I don't, I wouldn't want you going into the spring break with like some assignment hanging over your head or anything. So it's due on the 19th by midnight. I believe once again, that is Friday. The final draft then would be due um, on April 1st. Now, this is an interesting day because the college and the instructors are supposedly unavailable that day because it's a personal development day. But I am not tasked as an adjunct with um, requiring any sort of development or training seminars vis-a-vis -vis the college. So I'll still be available. We might not have a formal class meeting that day. Um, I might not be available for tutoring that day or anything like that as for the college's uh, demands. But uh, yeah, it'll be the, the day that the final draft is uh, and that way you'll be able to get it done too before the lead into the Easter week, if you uh, observe that particular celebration. The evaluation for this piece of material is a hundred points. So we're moving up from 50, or excuse me, 25 points for the draft and another 25 points for the final, which made 50. This one, you'll get a hundred points for the draft and 100 points for the final, so 200 points overall. The length is a, about 850 words, give or take. I can give or take a few on that, which is about three and a half pages. So you've got a little bit more to do with this essay. Now the format is the same. You have to use a size 12 Times New Roman um, font or uh, style. <clears throat> the paper should be double spaced. There should be a list in the upper left corner with your name, last name, the name of the assignment, the analysis, and the dates turn in. Hopefully, we should be 
include a neat title, which should be centered and in plain font, meaning it's neither bolded nor italic. In the upper right hand corner of the document up here, you want to have page numbers available. There's an extra wrinkle this time, which has been highlighted for you you need to include one professional or personal citation in the MLA style. Both an in-text citation, meaning a parenthetical citation right in the text of the essay itself, and an additional citation on a works cited page at the end of the essay, which is not included as part of the three and a half or 850 word account. So next week, we're going to spend some time, and uh, I'll even hand out a unique uh, assignment for you, um, which will task you with practicing and show you how to format citation source materials that you can use for the purposes of working in the citation. Okay, what is it that you're actually being asked to, to do though? What is an analysis? Oops. Well, here we go. As you're no doubt aware by this point, the world of Ready Player One contains a vast cornucopia of pop culture from the 1980s. The world of the Oasis creator, James Halliday Group. Your task for this paper is to develop a review of a single piece of pop culture ephemera. Now there's a lot to choose from within the book, but broadly you could select an album or a episode of a television show or a specific film, a piece of art. And when if I reflect on art, I'm talking about everything that would fall under that banner, including clothing or fashion styles the visual arts themselves, toys, games, video games, uh, that sort of thing, sculpture, etc. You could also pick a novel or an invention or innovation or others, other 80s era icon to review in order to deepen your knowledge about the world from which the oasis is derived. Now, a couple of quick points of clarification. 80s era icon. Some of the things that are mentioned in Ready Player One, some of the pop culture beats, are not necessarily confined to the 80s. In the past, for example, I had a student approach me with a keen interest in writing a paper about the television series Firefly, which is mentioned in the book. I certainly uh, agree to that. Another way to think about this project if you're not really interested in the 1980s, you're like, oh, that's not really a, I associate that with old boring stuff. That's fair. Uh, but you may want to approach this topic as thinking about this idea of what Halliday considered canon. What he found to be the most culturally important and appropriate things that were worthy of our time and attention. What do you think you would add into that canon? Because Halliday's kind of a, you know, in very basic terms, he's, he's kind of an old white guy, you know, and um, a lot of his interests reflect those parameters. So if you were going to expand the knowledge or the focus of a vast sort of uh, space like a virtual space like the Oasis, what kinds of things are missing, either from 80s culture or um, from uh, the uh, the culture in general that would that deserve to be added in to the Oasis? Maybe that's a different way for you to approach the same project. Let's also assume for a moment that you do want to uh, focus on an 80s era novel. You should probably pick a novel that you've already read. 
uh, one that you remember. Don't try to read a, a side novel or something like that. I would avoid that if that's, um, you know, what something you're pondering. Should I read another book from the 80s? Or, no, no, no. But it, let's say you'd read it or you'd read a Stephen King adaptation like Pet Cemetery just out of enjoyment. And you remember it. Well, that might make um, a good uh, focal point for a review for this particular type of project. Now, um, it is advisable, if possible, because I know that this isn't everybody's um, reality, but it is, it's, it is advisable, if possible, to consult your parents, maybe even your grandparents or guardians, to enlist their expertise in completing this project. That's right. One of your two options here would be a personal citation in MLA style. Maybe you can get the information right from the horse's mouth, so to speak, by interviewing or uh, discussing these parameters with your parents or grandparents or guardian, aunt, uncle, etc. All those sorts of things would, would count. Now, once you have drawn in on or focused on a specific artifact or film or television show or something like that, you'll need to actually write the review as part of the analysis. Now, the review should be comprised of the following elements. One, you need to describe the artifact in question. Specifically, I think you should develop three criteria that you're going to use to evaluate the artifact. In other words, what are your points of evaluation? Let's say you were going to review um, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe toy line. Okay, well, you might want to review uh, the scale. You might want to review its distinction from its competition, notably Star Wars and the toy aisle in that era. And you might want to uh, explain its lasting impact on culture in the form of a meme or the uh, uh, fact that new series are being developed. Uh, there was a, a film that kind of capped off the toy line, etc. Let's say for the sake of variety that you were more interested in something like the Rubik's Cube which is very iconic and brings up memories of the 80s right away. Why was the Rubik's Cube invented? What made it so interesting as uh, an artifact or, or as a puzzle game? And how did it evolve or what uh, continues to make it successful today, et cetera? Now, once you have those criteria in hand, you would develop each of those criteria specifically, preview them in the introductory paragraph, and then delve into each of the criteria in a specific paragraph. One of the things you may want to pause and think about in terms of your points of evaluation are what makes the artifact essentially of the period or what makes it essentially relevant to our text. You may also want to ask yourself some questions. Who or what company created it? How successful was the item? What factors contributed to that success? Or alternatively, what factors led to its downfall? Maybe it's no longer um, helpful or no longer a piece of uh, our current culture, maybe it's stuck in that era of the 80s. Along the way, you might want to um, elucidate on how the artifact improves a person's life or contributes to society in some way. You may also want to describe uh, how the artifact compares to other more similar items from that period before and after its initial creation. Then for criteria number three, I do have some specific criteria that I've, I'm trying to help you to develop as a point of reference. Now you could have a third unique criteria. I in fact encourage you to do this. 
because I think it might help you um, develop your own sense of style and focal interest on this topic. But consider this criteria three, if you can't think of anything else to write about, or criteria four, and I'll add that on there. If you don't want to uh, create your initial um, unique criteria, you can use this material as criteria four. But I would like you to pause long enough in the essay to reflect on the following questions. Does the subject appear in Ready Player One? If it does, how do the characters refer to it or interact with the object or item? If they do not, which is perhaps more frequently the case as students really like to have fun with this project and, for, and try to throw Mr. Fowler or the, the 80s guru um, Ernest Klein a curveball. If it doesn't appear in the book, how might the characters have interacted with it or used it? A lot of times uh, students will find um, artif musical artifacts from the period uh, that are either instrumental or uh, maybe just in a genre that was beginning to develop like rap or hip hop. And, you know, they'll speculate on how it could have been used or how it, uh, characters would have reacted to it. Um, why did you, and then why did you choose this item in particular to focus on? For your conclusion, of course, don't forget to do all the same basic things. Restate your thesis, restate the essential criteria you, you identified and try to close in a memorable way using the kind of pyramid uh, format to address those key points, starting with a specific topic sentence and then expanding it to a more general end statement. And for your end, general end statement, you could select a famous quote or joke, perhaps an item slogan, since we're dealing with the potential for uh, mass market goods here. You could echo back a line from the first paragraph to create a, an effect that sort of creates resonance with the beginning and conclusion. You could use a sentence composed of one syllable words to grab the reader's attention. You could set up an ending of the discussion by linking the object to the larger context or conclude with a sentence that's compound or parallel in structure because such sentences can establish a sense of balance or order that may feel just right at the end of a complex discussion. Okay, so that is a look at our next project, the analysis. I'm sure that you're going to have questions. I'm sure that you'll have concerns about uh, some of the content that we're going to cover and then weeks to come. And that's what I'm here for. You can email me uh, at any time or day and night, and I will, will get back to you within 24 hours um, to help you determine whether or not the topic that you're, you're, you're thinking about is appropriate to the scope of this particular assignment. You may have some ideas that I would suggest you save until the final project. This is a little bit of a bridge into the more research heavy sort of assignments that we've got going on. So um, don't take my uh, advice as, as essential as uh, necessarily a rejection. Um, I might ask you to say, hey, why don't you focus on these elements of the, uh, of the object in question and then bridge into a larger discussion about its validity and the argumentative paper. I await your comments in any uh, measure. Okay, Ready Player One from Kishwaukee Community College. I hope you enjoy the little um, homage to, or nod, if you want to refer to it that way, um, to the Goonies here, the Goonies poster. I always thought these, I think these little faux posters are pretty cool. Now, just to get you caught up, um, previously in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Uh, Wade Watts, aka Parzable, has completed the first series of challenges in James Halliday's Easter egg hunt. First of all, he finds the gate on planet Ludus, and that's a D&D module called the Tomb of Horrors. 
he completes the Tomb of Horrors and gets deep into the uh, tomb where he must play against the Lich King in a game of Joust, published by Williams Electronics. Wade is able to beat him by switching, switching sides, switching? No, by switching sides of the cabinet in order to disrupt the AI program of the Lich King. Effectively, Wade wins the Copper Key, but he's delayed by going to the next step by Artemis, who creates a barrier so she can question him and the two actually get to talk. And you can see Artemis similarly uh, going to the left here to defeat uh, the Lich King. But at the end of that 24 hour um, uh, field or, or uh, stasis field, whatever it, it was called, um, Wade must now travel to a planet. And the planet in question is full of versions of Middleton, Ohio, which is Halliday's hometown. There he locates Halliday's house, including a recreation of his boyhood room. He logs on to the computer, the TRS-80, and which the Dungeons of Daggeroth game had been published. Defeating that game creates a gate in the War Games poster that Halliday had hung up in his room. A plate appears over the poster with a keyhole. Wade uses the copper key to open the door and steps through and enters the film War Games, a new type of video game called a flick sync, which earns him the next clue in order for the game to continue, which leads us to chapter 12. Morrow and Halliday, you can see the creators here um, in this picture. Wake up Wade. Wade actually ends up going home and sleeping in the real world for about 12 hours, which means and he misses school, uh, a concern that begins to mount uh, for him because just like real world school, you don't necessarily want to miss a day because that might count against you. He explains that when he finally woke up, he rubbed his eyes and lay there in the silence for a while, trying to convince himself that the events of the previous day had actually occurred because after all, it did seem a lot like a dream. As he turns on the news to sort of get his bearings. He notes that every single news feed seemed to be showing a screenshot of the scoreboard in the Oasis. And his avatar's name was there on the top in first place. Artemis was still in second place, but the score beside her name had now increased to 109,000, just a thousand points less than his own. And like Wade, she had a copper colored gate icon beside her name now too. Ogdemaro is sort of described as a cross between Albert Einstein and Santa Claus. Now, Morrow was the second uh, part of the Gregarious Games company, uh, along with the cre creator of the Oasis and the egg hunt, James Halliday. Um, on the news program, Wade watches, questions are being asked about whether or not Parzival or Artemis will step forward. And Morrow has something interesting to say about that. He reads that they will not come forward if they're smart. And he says, if I were in their shoes, I'd do everything possible to remain anonymous. Because once the world finds out who they really are, they'll never have a moment's peace afterward. If people think you can trust them to find Halliday's egg, they'll never leave you alone. And I know that from experience. I wonder if this is a bit of foreshadowing. I, I happen to think that it just may be exactly that. Uh, please feel free to email or write to me directly if you ha have questions or you have thoughts about the book and whether or not you feel this is a piece of foreshadowing or not. In terms of a quick comparison, you can see here in the visual style uh, with the Space Invader shirt, the denim jacket and jeans, sometimes affectionately referred to as a Canadian tuxedo. <laughs> um, this look is very much inspired by John Lennon's look. The glasses, the kind of wild hair, 
but he was often uh, seen wearing a jean jacket and black t-shirt. I couldn't find a particular image here to match up with Paul McCartney, but Paul McCartney often also appearing with some kind of a collared shirt and vest. And I believe that visually, uh, Steven Spielberg was trying to create a, a striking comparison between the two. And famously, Halliday and Morrow split, as do Lennon and McCarthy when the Beatles come to an end. But the reason they split is also sort of mimicked or um, often attributed to what happened with the Beatles is mimicked in the book. Specifically, many people blame John Lennon's expanding relationship with Yoko Ono and her art movements and um, her political views as driving a wedge between John Lennon and the rest of the Beatles. And many people have come forward since to say that wasn't the case. It was more of a, an issue of four amazing talents wanting to get as much as they could out of their musical experience. And the fact that these men had been together from the time that they were young, you know, teenagers in many cases, um, until you know they were in their 30s so it had been uh, enough time in, in many people's concerns many people's views and that the idea of yoko ono being the sole reason for that occurring is um, a popular idea but not necessarily uh, completely true in this case, however, there's more of a statement to be made as the character of Kira may very well be the reason but, uh, for the rift that developed between Morrow and Halliday. And as it says in the text, the opposite sex made Jim Halliday extremely nervous. And Kira was the only girl I ever saw him speak to in a relaxed manner. But even then, it was only in character as Anorak during the course of our gaming sessions. And he would only address her as Lucosa, the, the name of her D&D character. Ogden and Kira began dating. And by the end of the school year, Wade explains, when it was time for her to return home to London, the two of them had openly declared their love for each other. Rumors also surfaced, whoops, that Morrow had chosen to leave because he'd had a huge falling out with Halliday. Neither of them would confirm or deny these rumors, and no one seemed to know what sort of dispute had ended their friend, long friendship. But again, it may be the focus of this uh, feat of this woman, uh, Kira, who later goes on to mar marry uh, Ogden Morrow. And the chapter kind of wraps up with Morrow's take on the entire point of the egg hunt. And he says that I think Jim made the idea behind it fairly obvious. He had always wanted everyone to share his obsessions, to love the same things he loved. And I think this contest is his way of giving the entire world an incentive to do just that. Harkening back to our earlier point, this would be a good uh, sort of natural progression, I thought, to use as our assignment for the purposes of an analysis. Now, you'll have to create analyses or reviews for um, many other classes, courses that you will take in your uh, college experience. So using this kind of pop culture goofiness as a way to ease into those projects should be fairly painless. And I, I dare say even a little bit interesting. Well, we'll see what you think of that as we uh, continue on that vein. H begins to call uh, Wade, and he says, uh, you know, Wade says, hey, what's new, H? And H, of course, is, what's new? You mean other than seeing my best friend's name up here at the top of the scoreboard? Other than that, not much, not much at all. Of course, he reveals in the background that he is at the entrance of the Tomb of Horrors. So H is getting a little help from uh, his friends. To advance. But he's not calling just to brag about finding the Chamber of Horrors, um, tracing back Wade's movements, but he explains, uh, or he asks rather, does anyone at your school know your avatar's name? Remember that at school, 
Wade is simply Wade three. He's not parsable like he is out in the Oasis. And Wade says, no, I've been careful to keep it a secret. And H says, well, that's a good thing because uh, several of the gunters who frequent the basement, H's hangout, know that we both attend school on Ludus. So they might be able to connect the dots. And I'm worried about one in particular, that being IROC, of course. And we'll see how that develops. Chapter 13 um, gets us into this concept of riddles and endorsements. Specifically, we learn a little bit more about IROC and his attempt at blackmailing Wade and H into revealing the information about the gate. And he says, I returned to school Monday morning considering the idea of calling in sick, but I was concerned my absence might raise even more suspicions. But when I got there, I realized I shouldn't have worried because due to the sudden renewed interest in the hunt, over half of the student body and quite a few of the teachers <laughs> didn't bother showing up. So again, this is big money. So even teachers have to ask themselves, is it worth missing out on the opportunity to advance in the hunt? Um, you know, even if I picked up this much uh, money in Oasis credits, I might get more than I was paid for uh, by the Oasis or public school systems. So um, that would be interesting. An interesting uh, conundrum for Mr. Fowler to puzzle over. Would I show up or would I go out to the hunt? I'd probably show up, to be honest with you. And of course, IROC um, sends emails to, to H and me, Wade says, attempting to blackmail them. He said that if we didn't tell him how to find the copper key in first gate, he'd post what he knew about us to every Gunter messenger board he could find. And when we refused, he made good on his threats. Of course, he had no way of proving he really knew us. Though. Which leads to the introduction of a couple of new characters, Daito and Shoto the Samurai. Daito meaning the long sword, the older brother of the two, and Shoto meaning the short sword or younger brother. Um, the two of them uh, also complete the quest and their names also appear on the scoreboard. Meanwhile, as other um, characters begin to advance on Wade's position, he's puzzling over the next clue. And he's got another quatrain here. The captain conceals the jade key in a dwelling long neglected, but you can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. And Wade just is completely baffled by this one. He keeps uh, working out whether or not this could have a, an allusion to Captain America or Captain Antoniel or some other sort of character. But in the meantime, he realizes that he has now been presented with a particular opportunity. And he said, I received several endorsement deal offers from companies who wanted to use parsable name um, and face to sell their services and products. These companies were offering to pay me an Oasis credits, which could be transferred directly into my avatar's account. So, you know, one of the things Wade discovers is that when you earn a certain amount of money, your money begins to work for you rather than you working to earn money. It's an odd phenomenon that uh, celebrities and, and uh, you know, athletes can encounter if they do things correctly. There are all sorts of stories about athletes and, and uh, celebrities who lose all the money that they earn, but many uh, conscientious performers and high paid uh, uh, per, uh, athletes find that the phenomenon of money working for you once you earn a certain amount of money is a real revelation. Oprah often is uh, accredited for this. Uh, she said that I used to work for money, but now, but once I earned my first, I think it's $100,000, I realized that the money could work for me. Meaning just that you can earn money back on the investment. If you live like a regular person, but find copious amounts of money, and then that money is, uh, you know, the basis of a, uh, you know, a, a nest egg that's developed uh, financially, you can be financially independent for 
majority of your life. Wade, of course, in his infinite wisdom, replies to every single one of the endorsement inquiries, saying he would accept the offer offers under the condition that, one, he wouldn't have to reveal his true identity, and two, he'd only do business through his avatar, wouldn't reveal his real identity, in other words. Now, this leads to kind of an interesting potential question for the third assignment. Um, and it's a question that's come up, up uh, frequently with varying degrees of, uh, of importance uh, over the years, which is sh whether or not college athletes should be paid for their likeness and uh, uh, you know, endorsements um, in the collegiate arena. Now, before you get too far ahead of yourself, you know, Mr. Fowler has changed his opinion on this over the years. I used to sort of be at, especially when I was a student, I was adamant that that would not be fair, especially to more uh, typical collegiate experiences. You know, students in my original perspective shouldn't be paid if they're a student athlete because they're being paid to attend the college. They're being paid in education, educational value. That's the, what their pay is. But that's not exactly as cut and dry as it appeared to be. Many of these young men and women uh, um, are used in promotional imagery. Their likeness is uh, used to promote products uh, and actually even uh, equipment in, in these tournaments. They're asked to wear a certain kind of uh, piece of sporting equipment to a certain brand of shoes, et cetera. And to deny them monetary gain when their image is used by the college, that's a little bit one-sided. So this idea of collegiate athletes and their value to the college system is one that needs a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of exploring all of the facets involved. A lot of money is garnered by sports attendance and by, um, you know, fans of collegiate level uh, games and sports. And that money is filtered into the school itself. And then that money can become the basis for a research grant it can become the basis for uh, student housing programs and other academic-based scholarships. So the sports-centered uh, idea of endorsement ideals is actually sort of more critical than just how they would or would not impact individual students, but rather how they impact the economics of a school system in general. So again, that might be a topic that you have a strong resonance with one way or the other, it may make uh, for a good basis in discussion for an uh, argument assignment. As this chapter, uh, chapter 13 winds down, Nolan Sorrento, the head of corporate IOI, sends Parzival an invitation. But Wade's weary. Uh, he reaches, researches Sorrento, feeling as though he's now ready to sit down with the devil. And he explains that uh, Sorrento had a PhD in computer science. Prior to becoming head of operations at ILI, he'd been a high profile game designer, overseeing the creation of several third party role playing games or RPGs that ran inside of the Oasis. I played all of his games, Wade writes, and they were actually pretty good. He'd been a decent coder back before he sold his soul. And that last phrase, before he sold his soul, is going to lead us into a longer discussion, uh, a much more detailed discussion when we get to chapter 14. But we'll save that for next time. Okay. Now I'm going to segue out of that for a minute. And I'm going to screen share uh, a little bit because we're going to wrap today up. Uh, by going through a little um, discussion about comma splices and fused sentences. Now, I noticed a quite a few of these, unfortunately, 
in our initial drafts for the self-assessment. So as we get ready to think about how to consistently uh, make our writing better and to recognize errors in our writing and in the writing of others, I think it's appropriate that we pause long enough to consider comma splices and fused sentences. You need to know how to identify these two major errors. A comma splice looks like this. It's whenever a main clause or complete sentence is joined to another main clause with only a comma. Remember that a main clause or independent sentence has three specific criteria that it meets. It must have a subject, it must have a verb, and it must express a complete thought. Now, if you have a construction like that and you link it to another similar construction, there is a way to do that with a compound sentence, but you need a comma and a coordinating conjunction. A comma alone is a special type of run-on called a comma splice. A fused sentence, by comparison, is just a main clause smashed together next to another main clause. That's a more traditional run-on. A subject and a verb, once again, expresses a complete thought. That's what's called a main clause, or the a central start of a sentence. Now, comma splices and fused sentences can make your sentences die on the <laughs> And we don't want that to happen. <laughs> Here's a sample sentence that's got some problems. Grandma still rides her Harley motorcycle. Her toy poodle balances in a basket between her handlebars. Those two ideas are smashed together. If you find the first noun or pronoun in a, in a sentence, you would select grandma. And what does grandma do? She rides, or still rides in this case, her Harley motorcycle. Her toy poodle, that's a second subject. And what does that poodle do? It balances. The poodle balances. And then we have a prepositional phrase to wrap it up and give it more context in a basket between the handlebars. So we've got two subjects and two verbs, which means we've got a few sentence. We know it's not a comma splice because there's no comma here. So the error is right there. There should be a period and a capital letter starting a new sentence. As Graham explains, a comma won't help. It will make a comma splice, which is as equally uh, terrible of an error. So let's take a ride to the solution section. First option is the one I explained earlier. Just put a period there and start a new sentence with a capital letter. Let's see if we can fix the errors that follow using that same correction, period, capital letter. While Oreo gnawed the corner of a shoe, Skeeter shredded a roll of toilet paper. The dogs love when we have forgotten to close the master bedroom door. In this case, you have two commas. So the immediate question is, which comma do you correct? Well, here, we have a subject, Oreo, and a verb, nod. But we also have the presence of while here. Well, while, of course, is a preposition, which explains the context of time or place to the reader. So we don't have a traditional sentence within a prepositional phrase. So while Oreo gnawed the corner, and then we have another one of the shoe. So those are uh, anchored to the main clause, which begins with Skeeter shredded a roll of toilet paper. So Skeeter shredded. This is the first main clause. So this comma after paper is the one that needs to be corrected. A bucket catches water under the leaky ceiling. Annette wishes she had trimmed the big oak tree before the rotten limb crashed to the roof. This one's easy. Uh, the comma needs to be replaced and Annette is the new uh, word that starts a sentence. 
Freddie's car is a mess. She has overdue library books piled up in the front seat, and she uses the floor as a trash can for her frequent lunches at fast food restaurants. Again, Freddie's car is a mess. The car subject is a mess, object, period. New sentence. On a busy Saturday night, Andre sweated in the hot restaurant kitchen as he assembled pizzas. He dreamed of one day having his own cooking show on the Food Network. Andre sweated. Where did he sweat? In the hot rust in the hot kitchen. Object. Period. Start of a new sentence. Now let's think about another option. And this might be more natural for a lot of you. You can fix errors like comma splices by keeping a comma, but adding coordinating conjunction, such as and, but, for, and, or, or, so, and yet. You can easily remember the coordinating conjunctions with the acronym FANBOYS. For, and, but, or, uh, oh, what, and, I forgot the N. For, and, nor, fan, boys, but, oh, uh, uh, but, or, so, and, yeah, but, or, yeah, and so. And again, we start with the original example. Grandma still rides her Harley motorcycle, comma, and her toy poodle balances in a basket between the handlebars. This time they're asking us to use the coordinating conjunctions with the commas to make complete sentences. Darren scooped seven tablespoons of sugar into his coffee. Then he splashed cream into the cup and stirred the concoction. So Darren scooped several tablespoons of sugar into his coffee cup. And then he splashed, yep, cream into the cup and stirred the concoction. Pretty easy stuff. We suspected that Tahoe had tipped over the trash. He flattened his ears and curled his tail between his legs as we cleaned the kitchen floor. Now, a lot of people say, could you use uh, because here? And the answer is yes. You could use uh, because after trash. Um, but they didn't ask us to use that form of a clause because that's a dependent uh, coordinating uh, conjunction or a subordinating conjunction. They want us to use the comma and one of the fanboys or coordinating conjunctions. So here we're going to have four he flattened his ears. Now, that doesn't sound perhaps as logical or as natural as our writing and speech patterns might um, allude to. And consequently, another question comes up here. Could I substitute for, uh, for but or and or so or uh, something like as or because? You could, okay, you could. But again, Sometimes they do feel strange if you don't have the right sort of transitional, um, or not transitional, excuse me, if you don't have the right sort of conjunction, it may sound more awkward than you'd originally intended for it. There's also somewhat of a debate. Um, would you use a comma in conjunction with the uh, word because? You don't have to. Uh, Strunk and white, the old style, um, Grammar gurus would suggest that you would use a comma with because. Mr. Fowler is not going to mark that down on your paper either way, but typically the move has become, going back to our first um, grammar lesson with commas, to not unnecessarily hook the eye of your reader with extra commas. So consequently, we tend to just use because sans comma. Uh, however, it's not a mistake per se, if you use it. Okay, butterflies had never visited the backyard. So Luana planted an assortment of flowers, yep, to entice them with their sweet nectar. Serena searched every corner of her bedroom. She could not find her math book to study for the final exam, but she could not find her math book. Option three asks you to fix the error with a semicolon. Now, semicolons are a really easy way to correct comma splices and run-ons, but you should try to limit them to, say, two times per given essay. 
they've kind of fallen out of fashion. Uh, and there's no other reason that we don't see them as much. I think a lot of it had to do with the rise of the popularity of the, the press in the United States. We had many newspapers um, and they were regionally and dis distinct. And one of the things that I think is really critically important is that a semicolon only be used um, every once in a while because uh, it's not incorrect to use a semicolon. It's just out of vogue. It feels sort of old fashioned or more literary than perhaps we are used to in the States. They suggest three or four times per essay. I would be comfortable with three to four times too, I think. But every time would get a bit, uh, I think, uh, repetitive. Don't capitalize uh, the word after the semicolon unless it's already a proper noun, like a name or uh, a state or uh, an important uh, event or something of that nature. One that's always capitalized. And when you're writing them by hand, which is rare, make sure that the semicolon has a posture. Specifically, try to locate the dot right above the comma when you make the, uh, the, the notation in by hand. And you can see it's a uh, segue. It's, it replaces the uh, period and capital letter system from the previous example. All right, Princess wants us to fix the errors that follow using semicolons this time. Smoke billowed from the hot grill. Thick pork chops lay on a plate waiting for Uncle Rick to cook them. Smoke, subject, billowed, verb. What's the object? From the grill, okay, semicolon. Lori flashed a big smile, semicolon. We cringed at the spinach stuck to her front teeth. Lori, subject, flashed verb. What did she flash? The object was a smile. So we completed a sentence at that point. It's got a subject, it's got a verb, it expresses a complete thought. That's a good way to track the um, semicolon. Remember that if you're having trouble with this, the first noun or pronoun in a sentence is almost always the subject and the verb is almost always following right on its heels. So literally the first two words of a sentence are typically the subject verb of a sentence. In English, that is. Jiggling his foot. Now, here's an example where we've got a, a ing or gerund word out there at the beginning and we've got a comma. So remember back to the commas PowerPoint from a couple weeks ago. It's all posted on D2L if you want to review, by the way. But we uh, talked about that as a, a certain type of construction. Remember, um, they were called modifiers, right? Oops, no, they weren't called modifiers. I, I said the wrong word. They were called, um, what are they called? Oh gosh, I'm, well anyway, they, they have an ing or gerund phrase uh, at the beginning. So it's set off from the main sentence as a comma. Why can't I remember that? Um, I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. But as you can see, the actual subject uh, comes up next and it's the word Carlos. So subject, which means the verb should follow right after the subject, sat, Carlos sat. And we have a prepositional phrase in the waiting room. He dreaded the shot of Novocaine required to fill his, copy, his cavity. Okay, um, so room is the object. Now, interestingly, a preposition can contain a um, object, but it cannot contain a subject, nor can it contain a verb. So the semicolon must go right here, replacing the comma after room. Okay, so let's see. Mm 
we have a pretty complicated construction here in this uh, sentence. Uh, again, I remember finally, participle. Uh, ing, that's what I was trying to think of, sorry. Participle phrases, an ing or d or ed word that starts as a phrase at the beginning of a sentence is set up by a comma. It's a participle phrase. It's also called a gerund in this case. So uh, jiggling, ing, gerund, his foot, it's a participle phrase that stacked on top of a uh, complete sentence or independent clause. Okay. Pushing, grunting, Tyrone tried to budge the heavy refrigerator. Finally, he decided just to paint around it, leaving a rectangle of dirty beige behind the appliance. Again, we have another participle phrase, pushing and grunting. So we start looking for the subject here. Tyrone, what did he do? He tried. To budge is not a verb. It's actually um, an infinitive phrase. So Tyrone tried is the core of the sentence. So we should replace refrigerator with, or the comma rather, after refrigerator with a semicolon and make sure that you put a comma after final. You can also fix the error with a subordinate conjunction. This is what I was talking about earlier when I was referring to the instances with as or because. And we can see a sample uh, from the original again. While in this case would be a good example of how to make that transition. And then you don't even have to worry about extra commas. You could also say, when grandma rides her motorcycle, comma, her toy poodle balances in a basket between the handlebars. There you do need a comma, but um, that does make for a slightly more in a lively sentence. So again, remember these general punctuation rules when you use subordination. If you link a subordinate clause with a preposition to the main clause, you need to signal that with a comma. But if the main clause comes first and the subordinate clause finishes these, a sentence, no comma is necessary. It's really just up to you to determine what your best writing preference is. Here's a sample. When grandma rides her Harley motorcycle, comma, her poodle balances in a basket between the handlebars. When is a preposition telling you or suggesting a specific time in this case or place. And as you suggest here, you could not end the sentence right there. You couldn't write a complete sentence that said when grandma rides her Harley motorcycle because that doesn't express a complete thought even though it does have a subject grandma and a verb rides. So you need to link that to a better standalone sentence. Her poodle subject poodle and what does the poodle do it balances in the basket between the handlebars so we've got a complete thought here because of the presence of when we need to have the comma we can just change it though to avoid the comma placement altogether grandma rides her harley motorcycle while her toy poodle balances in a basket between the handlebars grandma rides subject verb her motorcycle okay there could be a period there standalone sentence. But if you put while another preposition that includes time or that indicates time there, you can link that sentence to a standalone sentence and no comma is necessary. So let's try some subordinate conjunction corrections. Jeff licked the soft serve cone. He tried to keep up with the melting ice cream. Um, so I'm going to guess while right here. Okay, or as in this case, as he tried to keep up with the melting. In this case, the main clause comes first, so there's no comma necessary. Nathan rudely slurped the spicy soup. Maybell began loudly crunching tortilla chips. Since Nathan rudely slurped the spicy soup, comma, Maybell be loudly began crunching the tortilla chips. When you start with a subordinate, then you need a comma to link it to the main clause. Harold held his hand under the cold water. He burned his fingers trying to remove the brownies 
without an oven mitt. I think just a simple because should have worked here. Oh, well, after he burned in this case. All right. The flowers waited for rain or the cool spray from the sprinklers. They wilted in the sun as they waited for the rain or school spray from sprinklers, comma, they wilted in the sun. They is your subject, wilted is your verb. That's the complete or independent clause here. The presence of as makes the entire thing dependent. It doesn't express a complete thought, even though flowers waited is a subject and verb pair. It doesn't make sense if you were just to put a period there. A subordinate clause precedes the main clause, so a comma is necessary between them. Here we go. Find and fix all the comma slices and the few sentences that follow. I went to the bathroom last night. I heard someone singing in Spanish. A simple period with a capital uh, I would correct the sentence. Or you could use the um, coordinating conjunction for, or you could use the semicolon I, or you could even say, because I heard someone singing in Spanish. Now, what is that spider doing here? Hmm. Surprised, I turned on the lights. What idiot was making noise in my bathroom so late at night? So here again, we could say period after lights. We could, uh, and that, or, we, you know, um, whoops. That would be a good correction. So, okay, three. I looked everywhere, behind the door, in the closet, under the bathroom sink, but I couldn't find the source of the music. There, we need something. The scene was really weird. Semicolon, maybe, period, capital T, uh, comma, and coordinate conjunction here. There's that spider again. I listened closely. The singing seemed to be coming from the window above the bathtub. I listened closely. We need a period and a start of a new sentence here. The singing seemed to be coming from the window above the bathtub, so I stuck, stuck my head around the shower curtain and looked in all of the corners. It was unbelievable, period. There was a spider spinning a web behind my shampoo bottles. All the while, she was singing Spanish love songs. Two sentences here, semicolon after bottles. All the while, comma, she was singing Spanish love songs. When the spider saw me staring at her, she said, eek, period, or exclamation point. I wasn't used to... <laughs> I wasn't used to spiders <laughs> squeaking in surprise at me in my own bathroom. When the spider realized I was a human being, she crouched further behind the shampoo bottle, period. I, on the other hand, went to get a can of Raid. Oop. There she is. Okay. When I returned with the can of Raid, I pointed it at the poor spider, wishing for her, period. Or wishing for her death, rather, period. She, as a result, started singing even more beautifully. Did I, let's go back for a second. So here, uh, I pointed it at the, you could say I pointed it at the poor spider, period. But here they chose to say wishing for her death, period. She, subject, verb, started singing. Uh, in this case, as a result is an extra uh, piece of information. It is a prepositional phrase, uh, which is, of, of course, unnecessary information. So it could be thrown out of the sentence. As such, it needs to be surrounded with commas. OK. Did I really want to hurt this poor creature who sang such beautiful Spanish love songs? Question mark. Did I really want to poison her and cause her to die a slow death behind the shampoo bottle? This spider was frightful looking, for she had hairy legs, bulging eyes, and terrible pinching jaws. But I decided that if she would continue singing in her beautiful manner, I would let her live on the bathroom window ledge. That's okay, I think. Yeah. Every morning since that surprising evening, I listen to my singing spider, who continues to live behind a shampoo bottle. Again. I saw that!
<laughs> no problem with that. I brush my teeth to the melodic voice of a very talented arachnid, period, or semicolon, or a subordinating conjunction. While my spider eats whatever unlucky fly get trapped, flies get trapped in the house. I've learned to think before I spray raid. There's another need for a period or something there. Yeah. Uh, so we had uh, two compound sentences in that case. All right. Be kind to spiders or recall here. Oh, my goodness. I hope that's not true. Okay. Well, I hope that was effective as a sort of... Um, primer on well, perhaps review on subject and verb usage uh, as it pertains to how to recognize an independent or main clause as compared to a subordinate clause. Because when you can find the difference between a main clause and subordinate clause, determining where and when you place your commas and or subordinating conjunctions or periods or semicolons should be pretty easy. That should enable you to make conscientious choices to create good compound sentences while at the same time avoiding any kind of unnecessary uh, mistakes uh, or like run-ons or um, comma splices. Okay, that's it for today. I hope that you found this topic uh, to be interesting or compelling. If you've got questions this week, by all means, uh, make sure that you're reaching out uh, to me for, for context and to contact me, and I will talk to you a little bit more next week. Until then, keep reading and take care. Bye-bye now.